I would like to welcome everybody uh, who are right now in our webinar about renewable energy outlook and investment opportunities in Bulgaria. This webinar was organized uh, with DEIC and TESAP together. I will be moderating the webinar uh, as vice chairman of our Energy Business Council. Energy Business Council is a council in uh, DEIC. Uh, DEIC is a foreign economic relations board. Under DEIC, there are uh, country councils, business councils, and also sectoral councils. Energy business council is one of them. Within energy business councils, we have committees. One of the committee uh, we have is Renewable Energy Investment Committee. In our meeting, we have been discussing uh, opportunities to present uh, the countries that we can be successful in investing in renewable energy. So we were creating an idea to uh, set up some meetings and events together with the uh, opportunity that TESAP provided to us. We have decided to start with Bulgaria, our very close neighbor. And uh, we believe everybody will be very much interested in Bulgarian market, especially for renewable energies and especially for solar. As you may well aware, most of the energy investments nowadays are uh, renewable and the great ratio of the re renewable energies is actually solar. So it is better to talk about mostly, uh, especially solar energy, but of course we can uh, include very uh, comfortably other areas as well. In last uh, maybe eight to 10 years, Turkey has increased its uh, renewable energy capacity a lot. And especially in solar, in the last eight years, from almost zero to more than 12,000 uh, megawatts of installed capacity has been achieved. So at the same time, Turkey has started to invest in renewable energy uh, equipment sector. It started with actually wind uh, turbines, but now there's a substantial companies in Turkey. They are producing many uh, modules, solar modules, even uh, cells, and also steel construction parts, project development, and EPC companies. They are very much stronger than before. So we believe Turkey will have a big uh, share in the surrounding uh, markets and also uh, overseas as well. Today, we have very esteemed guests from this different uh, organizations. I would like to uh, cut it short and start with uh, Mr. Zafer Benni, uh, CEO of AUASH. Uh, and we will continue to our friends. And lastly, we will listen only our friends from Bulgaria. At the end of uh, speeches, we will have chance to have some questions. Question and answer session will be, I think, will be very useful. So uh, I would like to leave floor to Mr. Zafar Bandi right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Aydwan. Bulgaristan Energy Unity Mensusunu Kıymetli Başkanı, DEİK Enerji İş Konseyi'nin değerli başkan yardımcısı, saygıdeğer konuklar. Dear Chairman of Energy Management Institute of Bulgaria, Vice President of Energy Business Council of DEIC, and Honorable Guests. Komşularımız olan işbirliğimize ve yatırımcılarımızın bilgi birikimine önemli bir katkı yapacağına inandığımız bu güzide toplantımıza hoş geldiniz. Welcome to our very unique webinar, which I believe will provide an important contribution to our relations with neighboring country Bulgaria and noble job to our investors. Sözlerime başlamadan önce işbirliği için DEIC'e, ve katılımları için Sayın Neykol ve Saykova şükranlarımızı sunuyoruz. Uh, before I begin my address, I would like to thank Take for their cooperation and Mr. Neykol and Mr. Saykov for their attendance. Kıymetli misafirler, e, Türkiye olarak 107 gigawatt aşan kurulu gücümüz ve her geçen gün artan yenilenebilir kapasitemizle hem bölgemizde hem de dünyada önde gelen ülkeler arasındayız. Distinguished guests, 
As Turkey, we are the one of the permanent countries for the region and entire world in terms of 170 gigawatt installed capacity and increasing renewable capacity. Hidroelektrikten güneşe, rüzgardan jeotermal ve nükleer enerjiye kadar geniş bir enerji sepetiyle artan enerji ihtiyacımızı kesin kesintisiz olarak karşılıyoruz. We are able to supply our growing demand thanks to our diverse energy mix including hydro, solar, wind, geothermal and nuclear. 2000, 2023 yılı sonu itibariyle kurulu gücümüzün %56'sını yenilenebilir enerji kaynaklarımız oluşturuyor. Yenilenebilir enerjimizin toplam üretimdeki payı ise %42 olarak gerçekleşmiş durumdadır. The share of renewables in our installed capacity have reached out 56% and we generate 42% of our to total ele electricity need from the renewables at the end of the 2023. Yine 2023'te yeni devreye alınan 2 nokta gigawatt kurulu gücümüzün neredeyse tamamı yenilenebilir enerji kaynaklı olarak gerçekleşerek karbon sıfır hedefimize önemli bir katkı sağlamış durumda. As a very important important contribution to our net zero objective, almost all of the 2.9 gigawatt new capacity to our system last year have been renewable sources. Yerli ve yenilenebilir kaynaklarımızın payını en kısa sürede mümkün olan en yüksek seviyeye yükseltmek en büyük amacımızdır. Increasing the share of the renewables as soon as possible appears to the most important goal for us. Bu hedef kapsamında Bakanlığımız tarafından belirlenen 2030 ve 2035 planlarımızı da kararlılıkla uyguluyoruz. We firmly act according to the 2030 and 2035 plans of Energy and Natural Resources Ministry of Turkey. Amacımız 2035 yılına gelindiğinde toplam kurulu gücümüzü yaklaşık 190 gigawatta, güneş kurulu gücümüzü 53 gigawatta, rüzgar kurulu gücümüzü 30 gigawatta, ve nükleer enerji gücümüzü de 7 gigawatta ulaştırmak. Our main purpose is reaching out 190 gigawatt total installed capacity, 53, 53 gigawatt solar, 30 gigawatt wind and 7 gigawatt nuclear capacity in 2035. Böylece kurulu güç içerisindeki yenilenebilir payını %65'e, üretim payımızı ise %55'e yükseltmektir. In other words, increasing the share of renewables in the, in the installed capacity up to 65% and up to 55% in generation. Saygıdeğer konuklar, inanıyorum ki ulusal enerji eylem planımız doğrultusunda kamu, özel sektör ve akademi işbirliğiyle hedeflerimize kolaylıkla ulaşacağız. Honorable guests, I strongly believe that we will reach out the, all these objectives framed by National Energy Action Plan of Turkey within the cooperation of public, private sector and universities. Cumhuriyetimizin ikinci yüzyılına enerji sektörümüzle de damga vuracağız. As energy sector, we will mark the second century of, of our republic. Sözlerine burada son verirken, Bulgaristan'da enerji yatırım süreçlerini daha iyi anlamak amacıyla gerçekleştirdiğimiz webinarımızın verimli geçmesini temenni ediyor. Bütün katılımcılara saygılarımı sunuyorum. Ending up my address, I wish a productive webinar that aims to analyze the investment process in energy sector of Bulgaria and I pay my respect to all attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mr. Zafer Benli, for your speech. Now, uh, there will be a presentation from Chief Economist of DEEK, Mr. from Mr. Hakkı Karataş about renewable energy outlook in Turkey and also investment opportunities in Turkey for both sides. It's better to remember. Thank you. Please, Mr. Karataş, you can take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Errol Bey. Uh, my name is Akko Karataş. Uh, I am working as chief economist at DAIC. Today, I will just briefly present the energy outlook in Turkey and I will touch on the renewable part especially. So. I can you guess you can see my presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start with general uh, outlook of energy sectors. Then I will switch to electricity market and renewables, especially solar market, wind, hydrogen, and green hydrogen. And last, I will complete my presentation with investment incentives in Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a significant player 
but I cannot see to to see the single player in energy sector, not only in the region but also in the world. Uh, we are sixth largest access market in Europe with more than 100 gigawatts, and we are seventh in Europe with, in wind energy capacity. We are 16th. We have a ranking of 16th in the world in solar energy capacity and fourth in the world in geothermal energy capacity. Currently, as of 2022, we have 104 gigawatt installed capacity, and the share of this is around 54%. 10 gigawatt is coming from solar energy, 12 gigawatt uh, coming from wind. Currently, we don't have nuclear, but we are planning, and, and we will have uh, we are planning to have a 7.2 gigawatt in 2035. And hydropower is very important part of our electricity generation. And two gigawatt geothermal and biomass capacity. These are current numbers. And we are planning to increase our total installed capacity to 190 in 2035. And our share of renewables to 65%. Solar power from 10 gigawatt to 53 gigawatt. Wind power from 12 gigawatt to almost 30 gigawatt. And we will start using our nuclear energy and our aim is to reach 7.2 gigawatt in 2035. And hydro is still important, but we are having a less increase compared to other components of energy sources. In 2022, the Turkish government at the COP27 climate summit announced its strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 41% below business as usual levels by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions by 2053. And 2035 is the first checkpoint to reach ambitious targets towards our 2053 targets. So if you come to electricity market, there are uh, imported uh, players. The first one is Ministry of Energy and Nature Resources, the main governmental body responsible for carrying out energy policies in Turkey. Energy Market Regulatory Authority responsible for it's an independent body is responsible for regulating and supervising the electricity, natural gas, and oil markets. And Turkish Electricity Transmission Company, this is a state-owned monopoly that owns and operates electricity transmission market in the country. And Electricity Generation Company, it owns and operates the state-owned on power plants. And following July 2018, it also took over the wholesale trading responsibility of Tetash which is former state-owned wholesale electricity company. And we have Istanbul Energy Exchange, the market operator responsible for operating the day ahead, intraday and balanced markets in the country, and has managed the eligible consumers in spot markets since 2015. So this is the outline of the electricity market. We have generation, we have power plants almost close to 2000. And the point here is that in 2002, the share of private sector in, in electricity generation was only 40%. But now we reached 85%. So private sector is the active generation in Turkey right now instead of public sector. And we have transmission. After generation, we have transmission. And we have a length of 73.7 kilometers. And wholesale market, physical and financial trading exists in this market. Spot market is operated by exists since 2014. This is the market. And all the counter market is run through brokers. And after wholesale, we have distribution. We have 21 distribution regions have been operated by private entities since 2013. And these companies operate based on the operational rights contracts signed with Tedash. At last, we have 48 million consumers, retail consumers for in, in retail market. And this, this is the outline of the electricity market in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the source of electricity production, coal is still important. It says share of 35. 34.6%. Natural gas is important, 22.2%. But we are increasing the solar, wind, and uh, hydro as well. The hydro is currently 22.6%. Wind, solar, geothermal, and others, these are renewable energies. We are planning to increase the share of these uh, sources in electricity production. So if we look at renewables more closely, the cumulative average growth rate within the last 10 years, between 2011 and 2021, the average growth rate is 9% in Europe. In wind, it is 9% in Europe, whereas it is 20% in Turkey. In solar power, Europe has a cumulative average growth rate of 13%, and Turkey almost doubled 25%. Hydro 
growth is 1% in Europe and in Turkey it is 5%. And total, there are 5.7% in Europe and in Turkey, 9%. And you see the uh, wind and solar power will remain the main drivers of renewable growth in Turkey and other sources will be added to this to what, wind and solar powers. So if you look at more closely, we have an excellent solar energy potential according to the National Energy Plan, 52.9 gigawatt projected solar energy capacity by 2035. And the high potential comes with our increased number of solar projects, currently there are 9,635 solar projects, and these are increasing. And competitive cost structures continue to prevail in more state-established markets like Turkey, where total installed cost declined 5% between 22 and 21. So as cost of uh, construction declines, we are investing more in this area as well. And the second important uh, energy source is wind. We are currently, <clears throat> we, have, we are planning almost 30 gigawatt in wind power by 2035. Wind energy makes up 11% of the country's total electricity installed power. And we have eight ranking in new investments in Europe. And Turkey has many operational facilities, making it the fifth largest wind turbine component producer in Europe. Izmir, a city in Western Anatolia, is the wind energy capital of Turkey and the surrounding geography in Eastern Europe. And there are almost 300 operational wind energy plants. Hydro is important. We are eight in the world global capacity. Geothermal energy is also important. Condition process and regulatory reforms have allowed Turkey to scale up geothermal development, increasing its geothermal electricity capacity from 15 megawatts in 2008 to over 1.7 gigawatt equivalent in 2022. And we are a member of one gigawatt club, along with US, Indonesia, Philippines, New Zealand, and Mexico. These five countries are uh, constituted to one, one gigawatt club, and Turkey is also a member of this club. And according to the National Energy Plan, 5.1 gigawatt in geothermal plan and, and biomass power plants by 2035. And green hydrogen, Turkey aims to reduce the cost of hydrogen production per kilogram to $2.5 by 2035 and to halve this figure by 2050s. And according to the National Hydrogen Plan, share of hydrogen in gas mixture for 2035 is set at 3.5%. Installed electrolyzer capacity will reach 2 gigawatt in 2030 and 5 gigawatt in, 13, in 2035. So if you look at the incentives, this is the general investments incentives. We have general investment incentives. This is valid for energy and for other sectors as well. We have general investment incentives. We have regional investment incentives. We have strategic investment incentives and we have project-based investment incentives. General investment incentives are applicable for all companies, for all sectors and for all regions in, the, in Turkey. And there are VAT exemptions for machinery, for instance, and custom to the exemption. And regional investment Incentives, the uh, geography of Turkey is divided into six categories, depending on the uh, development of the regions. The one means that the most developed cities like Istanbul, and six means the least developed cities like East Anatolia or Southeast Anatolia. And for each region, we have different types of investments. Of course, when you are coming from one to six, the incentives are much higher and much more generous. And we have, for instance, VAT exemption for machinery, VAT exemptions for construction, customs duty exemptions, corporate tax reductions, social security premiums <clears throat> support, land allocation, and interest rate support. And uh, in addition to this, we have social security premium support for employee shares and income tax withholding support. These are the main incentives that we are providing for regional investment incentives. And for strategic investments, we, are, we have others. Incentives, for instance, VAT exemptions, additional VAT exemptions for machinery and construction, customs duty exemption, corporate tax reduction, social security premium, land allocation is still there, and interest rate support. And <clears throat> for specific project based investments, uh, we are having cashback support, VAT exemption again for machinery and for construction, customs duty exemption, corporate tax reduction, social security premium support, employee share and employee shares income tax withholding support, energy support, interest rate support, capital contribution support, land allocation, infrastructure support, purchasing guarantees, and facilitation of permits procedures. These are the main 
incentives that Turkish government is providing to all investors, including energy as well. So this is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions or any comments, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, uh, let's... Uh, Chair, Chair, may I ask a couple of questions? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, you made a reference to nuclear. And uh, in this aspect, uh, I have two, two questions. Okay. Firstly, what is the state of play of Akuyu uh, from the point of view of uh, its factual operation? And the second uh, po point about nuclear is related to the project idea of INEADA which is not far from, from the Bulgarian border. I know you have another plan for Sinop, but particularly this one for Ineada, what is the state of play? My second question is related to, you mentioned the incentives, but uh, uh, they were mostly uh, investment related. Do you have any particular incentives related to development of the networks in the context of getting more renew access to more renewables and my last point uh which is a very painful one it's painful throughout europe i saw in the last report of uh, the iea about turkey that there is a particular reference it concerns energy poverty one of the steps uh, towards fighting energy poverty throughout europe is via supporting the households for developing renewables for, for their use. What is the, if you can say briefly something about that in, in Turkey? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Karatesh, you can answer. Uh, regarding your question, Aku and Inada, I guess, I think maybe Zafar Bey can answer better if he's with us right now. Uh, the, listen, I cannot continue in Turkish for it. Safar Bey? Uh, he's not with us now, so he will come back later. And... Okay. Okay, we can answer this later, your question, Akuyant uh, Inada to uh, nuclear energy. And regarding your incentives, yes, we have investment incentives, but also we have other types of investments to, to encourage consumers, for instance, to install solar power or wind power to use with power. Yes, we have other mechanisms to encourage consumers to switch from fossil fuels to electricity consumption. Yes, we have uh, this type of incentives as well. And regarding, the, I, I didn't get your third point. You said uh, you have talked about the report of International Energy Agency. Yes, it is about the energy poverty. Because I know that in Turkey there is a special set of mechanisms which concern concern the support of more than two million households, uh, which concern both gas and electricity, uh, and particularly about the electricity part. The question is to what extent there is a particular incentive in in the policy of your government related the uh, the uh, relating the uh, related to the support of energy poor households to install for their own needs renewable facilities yes that, i get your point okay now yes the consumers are trying to build their own uh, solar power or wind yeah. power yes they are. the government is encouraging and gives incentives for these consumers as well so they switch from burning coal or uh, natural gas so they use electricity and they generate their energy they own generative in their mm -hmm. buildings and they use the energy they produce and they sell the rest to the governments this is a mechanism that we have currently in turkey so the government okay. also encourage consumers in that case as well okay uh, um, uh, you you will hear in our presentation afterwards this is also a very painful moment for for for, for, for bulgaria uh, in principle terms, but also from point of view of the energy poverty. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, no. Kalyan, I don't have other questions. If Kalyan has, I don't know. Okay, thank I got you. a question. The nuclear plant in Akku, the most recent developments in Akku and Inada, uh, yeah. 
give answer later, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. You thanks know that we are competing there. We are competing about nuclear with you. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, let's continue with presentation about TESAP by Ms. Aitan Sumer. Stage is yours, Aitan. Sesin is şu an kapalı. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me share my presentation. Although it is in Turkish, I will speak in English. Okay, let's start. Uh, hello to all participants. Uh, there are more than uh, 80 participants for the time being. Thanks to everybody uh, to this interesting webinar. This is the first one uh, in collaboration with DAIC. We wish to continue this collaboration uh, with other countries. I would like to give special thanks to DAIC uh, team and Mr. Erkan Alan for organizing this a beautiful event and Emmy uh, and with our uh, guest speakers, Mr. Nakov and Mr. Stakov. Uh, let me give you a brief information about uh, TESAP. TESAP was established in uh, year 2005 by ministerial decree to represent Turkey in Euroelectric. Uh, and TESAP is also Secretary Turkey National Committee since 2014. Last four years, uh, TESAP uh, reorganized and or organized working groups within TESAP activated in electrical energy sector. Uh, this is the uh, schema of our organization, and it is just like in the organization uh, of Euroelectric uh, working groups. Uh, there, are, there are more than, uh, these are the numbers in Euroelectric uh, Turkey. Uh, there are uh, more than 500 uh, experts from public and private sector, uh, academicians and consultants. They are working in uh, working groups on a voluntary basis and they prepare publications, uh, organizing webinars, meetings and something like that. These are our publications. Uh, each one is the first one in their uh, subject. Uh, Five, five publication in three years. And the uh, red one is our uh, Republic of Turkey history of electrical energy. It covers more than uh, 100 years. And uh, let me say it, uh, a little bit about our uh, conference, which will be organized uh, October 2 and 3rd of this year. This is the first one and uh, organized in Ankara. Uh, we are uh, working on uh, energy strat strategies uh, and uh, six main topic and uh, 46 subtopics. We announced to collect uh, the uh, summary of articles. Uh, we hope to meet you all energy sector stakeholders in uh, in the conference. Thanks again to all and uh, I wish a fruitful event. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aytan Hanım. Now uh, we will continue with presentation from for EMI Renewable Energy Outlook in Bulgaria by uh, Mr. Nekov, chairman of EMI. Stage uh, is yours. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. In fact, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned to you, we have a, a PowerPoint presentation which I'll leave uh, substance wise to Mr. Stykov. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would uh, I like to say a few words and make a couple of very concrete proposals for you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, let me underline that um, EMI, as uh, you will hear later, is not a state uh, structure. We are not, we have not been established by uh, any form of uh, state level uh, decision. In practical terms, we unite the biggest uh, foreign and national investors in the country. And just to give you the perspective of the size, although they are only four, 
um, the, the, the level of their investments uh, compared to the current GDP of the country represents a little bit above 5%. That is four companies which have invested in Bulgaria, a little bit uh, more than 5% of the current GDP of the country, which is a little bit less than 100 billion uh, euros. Um, this is simply to, to, to indicate the size. From this point of view, I wanted to uh, underline clearly that you might hear very different opinions about the energy sector developments in general terms and also about renewables in Bulgaria. So we shall express our view, our opinion uh, on, uh, uh, on that. Honestly, uh, I, I've been for 32 years in the energy, involved in the energy sphere, most of which are in uh, Bulgaria, but not only. And I've never believed that I will be still surprised by what is going on as uh, as uh, uh, developments. Uh, we definitely follow the political developments, but we do not deal with politics. This is the other issue I, which I wanted to mention. Although uh, we have been regularly invited and we participate in uh, governmental activities, in parliamentary activities, just uh, for illustration, the uh, current update of the Bulgarian energy strategy is ongoing, and both me and Mr. Stajkov are personally involved in this process following an invitation uh, by the Bulgarian Minister of uh, Energy. We also take very active participation in the debates in the parliament, particularly in the uh, parliamentary uh, group on the parliamentary commission on uh, on energy but uh, we uh, i want to clearly underline this we represent business partners however we are doing our best to be as objective as we can following the eu and international and uh, regional and national developments and we present uh, our independent opinion uh, in uh, in all these um, in all these aspects. Uh, as the focus of um, our uh, consideration today is uh, linked mostly to to renewables, um, I just want to say that uh, currently we kind of so far seem to be focused mostly on um, uh, solar. Uh, and uh, this this has a very strong uh, objective behind. But um, we in Bulgaria also have uh, a very good example of a wind farm, and it belongs to one of our members, AES. It is a little bit uh, less than 200 megawatts. Uh, it's uh, on the on the seashore. So this is another aspect which we also follow, although currently at this stage compared to uh, solar wind is uh, uh, lagging behind capacity wise, but still there is a, there's a huge, uh, huge capacity, uh, huge options forward. Now, uh, it was several times underlined how important uh, this practical cooperation uh, between uh, our countries and between uh, the businesses of our countries are. And this is why, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, I come to you with three very concrete proposals from my side, and then I shall leave the, the floor to Mr. Stajkov. The first proposal is that um, on the 26th to 28th of June this year in Sofia, there is a there's the fourth edition of the so-called green transition, uh, and uh, I shall be happy to send a formal invitation to TESAB about participation. Plus, you're most welcome to circulate it further. Just to mention that we shall have three European commissioners coming live 
to Sofia. This has been confirmed. Uh, we have um, uh, deputy prime ministers, ministers who have confirmed also from all around uh, Europe and of course a huge business community. Uh, so you shall get a formal invitation from me, from, from my side on, uh, on that. Uh, I will just appreciate that you tell me whom exactly I, sh I should address about, uh, about that so we do not intervene with the protocol. Uh, my second proposal to you is uh, linked uh, to um, an invitation that we organize together, a formal live meeting between the businesses, between the energy businesses. We can, we shall be happy to have it in Sofia, the first one. Let me tell you that we have had already such experience with our Greek colleagues. We are talking about a meeting which lasts uh, no more than half a day, that it is not time consuming. And uh, we invited uh, the representatives of the, of the two governments. We shall be happy to have your ambassador uh, invited as well. And the idea is that uh, aside this type of presentations and exchange of views, which we have now, we have also very concrete discussions of concrete investment opportunities, very concrete. And uh, as a follow-up, if uh, some of uh, your members are interested in concrete project opportunities related to development of any kind of energy projects, we should be happy to facilitate them. And my last point, my last proposal, is related to something for which I'm going to send you a link uh, right away within the within the, uh, the Zoom format to a publication, the journal, which is published annually. It's called Energy and Climate Diplomacy Journal. I'm editor-in-chief of this journal. It is an edition of the Bulgarian Diplomatic Institute. And I shall be mostly delighted if uh, any one of you, uh, maybe on behalf of TESAP, contributes with a short article for this year's uh, edition. The topic of this year's edition is related to the uh, geopolitical changes uh, and their influence on energy and uh, climate policy and politics. So it's very broadly formulated, but I will send you the link so you see the, the format, the style. Last year, for example, the, the, the, the key authors uh, included the ambassador of uh, Greece in Sofia, the secretary general of Euro Electric, Christian Rubin, who was also uh, one of the uh, authors, but you will see, uh, you will see all that. So with these three proposals, uh, in concrete, uh, I will uh, just want to underline that we are very grateful for your initiative, but uh, we shall propose and we shall be happy to contribute that we turn it uh, firstly in a kind of a more regular and more practically oriented uh, format targeting concrete business, uh, uh, business opportunities. Uh, as you know, in Bulgaria, now the potential for renewables is huge, of course, compared to the size of Turkey and the scale of, uh, of the, the economies. We are uh, rather small, but there are long term traditions in cooperation, and I hope that we shall be able to further uh, stimulate them. But this, this is from my side, and I shall ask Mr. Stipe to make our to present our presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Neko. Before uh, continue with Mr. Uh, Stajkov, uh, I would like to remind that our participants can send a uh, question if they can. If not, they can uh, yeah. somehow reach our team and send their questions. But before they send a question, I would like to uh, direct uh, a few general questions. Now we have uh, yeah. investors in this webinar, and those webinars uh, 
<clears throat> is actually trying to understand several uh, questions in their mind. First, why we should invest in Bulgaria? How we can invest in Bulgaria? What could be cooperation possibilities that we can uh, search or try to find? So if you can provide also some uh, practical basic information about uh, investment for the investors in Turkey, it would be very uh, beneficial. Currently, there are actually several uh, investors in Bulgaria already. They have invested, but their numbers are not so much. I think we should uh, attract more investors from Turkey to Bulgaria. So we expect uh, your insights and uh, clues about uh, investing strategies. Yeah, we can continue with the cycle as well. I propose that uh, you first hear the, the, the presentation of Mr. Tycho, uh, because some of the answers are already there uh, to, to, to your questions, but then if there are still open issues, we shall continue, okay? okay. Mr. Neko, uh, in your uh, internet connection, I guess there is a problem. We hear you, we understand you, but the quality of sound is not so well. Okay, thank you very much. It's the same with me, unfortunately. Okay, bye. Well, thanks. Um, Let's well, continue the presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Neko uh, mentioned about the uh, IME and its structure, its functions, its uh, main objectives. Um, these are the, just to highlight, these are the member companies. One is a, a thermal power plant producer, which also owns uh, a wind park, as Mr. Neko st stated. And the other three companies are distribution, electricity distribution companies working with a uh, regional license. You mentioned uh, you have around 48, I think, in, Tur in Turkey. Uh, we have only three, a much uh, smaller country. And of course, um, uh, they were, we had a, a few more back in the day before 20, uh, 2004, but they were consolidated into uh, three main companies. So these are the member members of the IME. Um, IME is also a member of uh, Euroelectric. Um, this presentation is going to be uh, sent uh, to you afterwards, so you can uh, familiarize yourself with the uh, with the details. But we also take active part part in uh, Euro Euroelectric's work, uh, studies, committees, and so on. So this is the general outline of the of the presentation. Uh, we're going to go over the outlook of the Bulgarian electricity sector, general overview of facts and data, some legal processes and frameworks. There have been a lot of changes in the past couple of years. Uh, and of course, national uh, legal RES support frameworks. This is a much, much more narrow topic than, uh, than the one we saw in your presentation. Uh, as I said, uh, a lot of things have uh, changed in the past uh, couple of years. So the um, general outlook of the sector um, in 2023, we saw um, a, a total installed capacity of renewable sources around two gigawatts, of which uh, seven gigawatts, sorry, of which two gigawatts um, uh, are uh, nuclear uh, power. This is the old um, nuclear power plant that we have, Kozuldui, with two uh, 1,000 megawatt blocks. Um, the target, the renewable energy target for 2030 currently is uh, to reach 10.9 gigawatt uh, installed capacity, although currently the government is working on an um, actual uh, updating the National Energy and Climate Plan, which could update the uh, renewable uh, energy sources uh, target as well. Um, in the last uh, two years, I think we saw almost a tripling of, well, actually quadrupling of uh, installed renewable solar capacity mainly. Uh, we started with around 1.1, 1.2 gigawatts back in 2020, and currently we're 
I think over 3.7 gigawatts in solar alone. Uh, and by the end of the year, I'm pretty sure we're going to top four gigawatts of solar. Uh, installed wind, wind capacity have been uh, has been stagnating. It's been around 700 megawatts for the past, I think, seven or, or eight years. Uh, there are a lot of projects in the pipeline. Unfortunately, they have um, a much longer period to uh, to develop and connect to the grid. And of course, there are a lot of uh, a lot more uncertainties related to them. So, their development is still lagging behind. Although we expect to see uh, new wind installations to be connected to the grid in the next couple of years. Uh, Solar capacity, as I mentioned, according to the current um, energy and climate plan, is supposed to reach 5.5 gigawatts in 2030, although by the end of this year, I'm guessing we're going to have at least 4 gigawatts, which means that uh, the, the, the chances of actually overshooting the target are quite, uh, quite real. Um, the Overall target currently the target uh, the the share of renewables in gross final energy consumption is around nineteen percent and the target for twenty thirty is thirty four percent. Of course, this target um, encompasses all energy consumption, not electricity alone. So even if we have an overshoot of the electricity target, maybe we're gonna have an undershoot on on other front front. Uh, transport is one of those for sure. So this is something to um, actually look uh, forward to. Um, this is the main overview of the sector, some facts and figures. As you can see, um, installed capacity has been increasing and it has been increasing primarily in solar. As you mentioned earlier, this is the, the favorite technology for new investors, especially in the past two years. Um, electricity generation has been increasing until 2020, but then again, 2020 was the um, difficult year for the energy sector in Europe in general. So this increase in generation from Bulgaria was actually due to higher external demand from mainly from Central and Western Europe. And of course, as soon as uh, the energy markets uh, Calm down a little bit in 2023 we saw a sharp decline in uh, in energy production as you can see energy production electricity production in 2023 is actually below the covid pandemic year of 2020 and of course there are a lot of um, explanations for this of course we had the uh, very warm winter we had a lot of new uh, renewable insta installations for own consumption so for example factories are in, uh, investing in renewables and thus decreasing their uh, electricity demand. So there's different um, factors that actually contribute to this. And of course, we shouldn't forget that there, ha there has been uh, a decline in uh, economic activity, which again contributes to uh, a decline in electricity uh, consumption and in general uh, energy consumption. And on the last graph, you see um, the different, um, well, the, the behavior of imports and exports. Uh, as you know, Bulgaria is traditionally an exporting country. Although in uh, in twenty twenty, by the end of twenty twenty three, we saw a, kind of a different behavior. We saw two months in twenty twenty three when Bulgaria was a net importer, and we saw the same uh, behavior this year in the beginning uh, in January and February, which is mainly due to uh, new investments in um, low carbon generation in the region, both from uh, Turkey, Greece, uh, Romania. So little by little, we see that the electricity mix of uh, Bulgaria is kind of losing its, its uh, competitiveness. So we expect this trend to uh, continue in the next couple of years, unless there are, of course, new investments in uh, low carbon uh, generation, which can actually compete on the market. Uh, the electricity grids, uh, we've prepared some uh, information for you, but the general, um, the general uh, uh, bottleneck 
to new renewable developments has become the electricity grid, both the transmission and the distribution grids. Uh, in the past couple of years, we saw a lot of um, administrative procedures being uh, either removed or uh, fast-tracked, st uh, streamlined, so, so as to encourage new renewable investors to actually uh, take up the, the initiative. Unfortunately, this hasn't been done for uh, the construction of electricity grids and thus constructing new uh, capacity, grid capacity for the connection to new renewables has been lagging behind. Um, we see this problem on a European level. We saw that Euroelectric has uh, advocated for um, kind of um, I'm sorry. So Euroelectric has been advocating for um, kind of developing um, the grid capacity before investors actually uh, try to invest and of course develop their projects. Unfortunately, this is a very long and very hard process. So this is gonna be um, kind of a bottleneck for new investors for the foreseeable future, in my opinion. Uh, and of course, the government has been working on uh, resolving the issue, but as I said, uh, things have been moving a little bit too slow. So this is one um, bottleneck that should be uh, kept in mind when considering new uh, energy investments in, in the country. Uh, the outlook of the Bulgarian sector, electricity storage, of course, is a very important um, niche segment that hasn't been developed yet. Of course, given the large investments in, um, in solar power and electricity storage, is definitely one of the keys to actually balance the system and of course um, find a safe haven from uh, zero or actually negative uh, prices from the sunny hours of the day. Um, we've had some government programs, uh, one of those programs uh, target targeting electricity storage. One of those programs is related to the uh, recovery and resilience facility, which is a facility that was developed on a a new level to um, kind of balance out the negative effects from the COVID crisis. So this is one of the programs. Um, it's currently it's focused primarily, almost entirely on financing uh, electricity storage. Uh, this could be used both for new renewable installations and old one which were connected to the grid um, after 2020, I think. So this is an opportunity both for new investors and uh, current investors to actually uh, kind of balance their uh, their load in a way. And of course, um, the transmission system operator has been opening the possibility for renewable energy sources uh, generations to actually contribute to uh, the bal balancing the system. So both new investments and electricity storage uh, equipment could uh, provide these services and of course uh, this is another business opportunity for uh, for investors um, the legal process um, we've outlined all the um, all, all the normative uh, the entire norm normative framework um, as I said in the past couple of years mainly as um, as a result of the recovery and resilience facility, Bulgaria has improved considerably the investment process for new investors. Uh, unfortunately, this, um, this is mainly focused on solar, as I said. Uh, not enough has been done, in my opinion, for uh, improving the investment environment for wind uh, investors. And this is a challenge that we see uh, at the European level as well. In the, for example, in the past uh, year, we saw um, triple uh, we, so, new solar capacity was tripled that of uh, new wind capacity. So in Europe, we see the same delay in development of uh, new wind projects. So this is um, an opportunity, and of course, um, some a topic that the government would have to uh, address in the, in the next couple of years. Unfortunately, currently we're seeing some political turmoil, and this is um, it, it's difficult to uh, to actually project or 
form some expectations when this uh, issue could be somehow resolved. Uh, again, this is the outline of the uh, legal process and main strategic documents. This is just for your uh, benefit to actually see how, how the process is structured. Um, one considerable drawback uh, we saw in the earlier presentation, Turkey has a very clear uh, energy strategy for the next years. Unfortunately, Bulgaria doesn't have one currently. It's still being developed. We're looking forward to uh, the government pu publishing the, uh, the final the final version of the uh, of the strategy, but unfortunately, um, it's still it's still lagging behind. Um, we should have some idea of uh, what the the outline of the uh, of the strategic thinking of the government is by the mid by middle of this year when they should publish the um, updated national electricity and climate plan. Uh, and of course, the government has said that uh, the energy strategy should be aligned with this plan. So they should um, basically look in the same direction, don't have any controversies and don't um, kind of fight with each other, which is something that we have seen in, in previous years. We've seen different strategic documents not being aligned with each other, but rather one updating the other and uh, presenting new targets, new ideas, new projects, and so on. Um, hopefully, this drawback will be solved uh, with this government and with these strategic documents. But as I said, we will have to wait until middle of this year to actually see this uh, this come into place. Um, this is the general uh, legal renewable energy support framework. Uh, there's a system of incentives, not as generous as the, as the one we saw uh, in Turkey. So, for example, since 2014, financial support and guaranteed uh, purchasing of uh, renewable electricity has been abandoned. Um, and currently, the government doesn't foresee anything uh, in this regard for the uh, period until 2030. We don't see uh, investment incentives, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with the plan for um, supporting uh, electricity storage. The financial support is targeted primarily solely on electricity storage and not on, um, on the renewable energy sources. So this is currently the focus of, uh, of the government. However, there are still some uh, support instruments. For example, there's a provision of guaranteed access to renewable electricity to the transmission and distribution electricity networks subject to compliance with security criteria but as i said uh, the um, the electricity grids are facing serious uh, problems with providing the, capa the needed capacity for um, connecting connecting new uh, renewables guaranteeing the transmission and distribution uh, in compliance with security criteria, ensuring the construction of the nece necessary infrastructure and power capacities for the regulation power system, provision of priority dispatching. This is, of course, very important, especially uh, currently the weather outside is very sunny and I'm sure the uh, solar, uh, solar pl plants are, are currently booming. Um, and of course, purchase of renewable energy uh, renewable electricity produced by facilities with a total installed capacity of less than 500 kilowatts, according to concluded long-term contracts under an article of the Electricity Act. So this is um, the old support scheme. Until 2018, uh, all renewable energy sources um, had uh, feed-in uh, premiums. After 2018, um, some producers with installed capacity of more than of at least 500 kilowatts had to switch to from feeding premium uh, feeding tariffs to feeding premiums and of course they had to sell uh, their uh, their production on the uh, Bulgarian electricity exchange and of course this is the last point I'm sorry I uh, I was in a hurry, I guess. Preferential prices feeding premiums for renewable producers with concluded long-term agreements before 2018. This is the main uh, support framework. As I said, uh, the government currently hasn't um, stipulated that uh, it's going to introduce new support mechanisms. 
by the way, as I mentioned in the past two years, we saw um, around 2.5 gigawatts of new solar capacity. All of this was, um, was actually installed without any support mechanisms. So we can see that the investor investor's interest is very high. Administrative procedures have been improving in such a way that they have actually um, improved the process. And currently, it would seem that um, additional support for such investments is not uh, necessary. Although, as I mentioned, this is plainly speaking for solar, for wind, it's another story for thermal, again, a different story. Uh, so for the purpose of introducing favor favorable uh, framework to pr promote facility and facilitate the development and the production of renewables, steps have been taken to improve the, uh, the framework. There have been um, steps in the recovery and resilience plan, there, are, uh, there is a pilot project for developing uh, geothermal energy. Unfortunately, until this point, we haven't seen a lot of development on that front, and it's still something in development. We're looking forward to actually seeing something on the uh, on the topic because, as it would seem uh, from different studies, Bulgaria has some potential. Uh, and this is an area which is definitely lagging behind for the past 20 years. I think this is an area which could be uh, interesting for Turkish invest investors because Turkey has been <clears throat> one of the very good examples in uh, worldwide in developing uh, geothermal. And as I said, Bulgaria has some potential. Unfortunately, the legal framework currently isn't as favorable as one might expect. And as I said, the government isn't um, very stable currently. So there are still some issues on, uh, on this front. Uh, more legal framework, I'm not gonna go over uh, the entire slide. Um, and this is some more uh, information on feeding premiums because there's a lot, there are a lot of differences between different um, different producers so depending on installed capacity the period um, the time frame at which um, the producer was connected to the grid they have different preferential uh, prices and of course different uh, feeding premiums so it's very difficult to give you a, a kind of a summary of everything so that's why we've tried to um, give different scenarios and basically you have to look at if you want to analyze diff different uh, business models you would pretty much have to look them uh, case by case uh, and these are the brackets for different producers with their preferential prices as of um, the current uh, price period so until um, june 2024 you can see that prices vary significantly and of course all of these uh, producers mainly sell their energy on the day ahead market because the bulgarian market is structured in such a way we saw the same behavior and uh, behavior in europe in the past two years although in uh, western and central europe's at least for the past seven eight months we've seen an increase in bilateral contracts, long term, longer term contracts, and moving away from the day ahead market. This hasn't happened on the Bulgarian market yet, but as we saw um, with the market reform that was proposed by the European Commission, uh, there are several instruments aimed at stimulating longer term markets and, of course, developing uh, the market for PPA agreements. Um, Of course, this is the um, support from the through the National Plan for Recovery and, and Resilience. As, as I mentioned, its main support is focused on um, energy storage. But the general idea of the plan, and of course, this has uh, found its way both in the energy strategy and the um, electricity and climate plan, is that Bulgaria is aiming to develop uh, a low carbon economy, both in the uh, energy sector, so reducing uh, the carb carbon footprint of the energy sector and in its industrial and transport sectors, 
most of the, well, pretty much all of the uh, policies are aimed, aimed in, the, in this direction. Uh, and here we've outlined just a couple of, uh, of the initiatives for um, from the plan. Of course, we have the um, renew, new renewable installations with electricity storage. We have a support for renewable energy for households. This is something Mr. Nakov mentioned in terms of uh, energy poverty and measures that could be aimed in uh, reducing the, the issue. Uh, support for energy efficient uh, street lighting system. This is on a, a basically municipal level and support for the development development and exploitation of geothermal energy, something that I mentioned earlier. And of course, production of green hydrogen and the National Decarbonization Fund. These are new initiatives that are still in development. Um, it's currently, it's difficult to um, to put a timeline on the on the project, but this is another uh, area that the government has been trying to uh, to address, and of course, introduce new measures to which could help develop the um, green hydrogen economy. Okay. Some of the conclusions, as I mentioned, one of the main uh, issues uh, regarding the um, regarding new investments in in electricity, specifically, especially in renewables is development of the grid. Um, the, the planning and the uh, regulatory instruments that are being applied in Bulgaria are still somewhat old fashioned. I expect to see uh, some development in the next couple of years, but again, this is uh, an issue that should be um, addressed. Um, there are <clears throat> not enough funds for developing uh, the district, um, the distribution system, uh, the distribution systems, which is an issue until last year, I think, uh, around 60-70% of solar capacities were connected to the distribution grids, and just 30%, 30-40% were connected to the transmission grid. In the past year, we saw a considerable shift uh, in this process, although it is your elect electric's opinion, and there have been a couple of studies on this, that by 2030, new installation, new generating capacities in the EU in general uh, will be mainly connected to the distribution grid. Their projection is around 70%. And this would mean that, again, the distribution grid would need to be uh, considerably uh, developed. And of course, we need to find financing for, the, uh, for this development. So this is, this is the new administrative uh, burden, the new red tape. So the new red tape is actually the physical capacity to the grid. By the way, we've seen um, such issues in, in different countries. So for example, in, in the UK, you have waiting lists. So a new investor who would like to connect, it, connect, connect its uh, facility to the grid would receive an, uh, a date for connection somewhere around 2040, 2045, something like this. And we've seen other examples uh, in which um, the new installation is developed, it's ready to connect to the grid. Unfortunately, the grid doesn't have the capacity. So the new installation just sits there, ready. I think this is, yes, this is it from uh, our side. I'm sure I haven't addressed everything that uh, you wanted to hear, but this is why we have the Q&A and I'm sure your questions are gonna be much more interesting than the, uh, the presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarkov. Uh, I have seen several questions and also through uh, your uh, presentation, I remembered that uh, first time I saw a solar uh, farm was in Bulgaria, actually. So it was so early time. It was full uh, tracker system. It was so impressive. At that time in Turkey, there was almost no uh, solar farm. So in Bulgaria, actually capacity increased so fast, then it stopped almost completely. As far as I know, the total installed capacity of solar is close to two gigawatt. As far as I know, I don't know whether it has increased or not. And now I heard that uh, you're planning uh, solar capacity or storage capacity with uh, 1.4 gigawatt of solar plus uh, storage, I don't, I didn't understand that. But my question is that, 
just as an ordinary uh, investor. If you go Bulgaria, what are the options for us to sell electricity? One of them you mentioned already, they have market. It is okay. Other option could be a PPA with some maybe trading companies. Why we need this kind of support for sales because of finance. So very practically, uh, acquisition of land or renting of land. What are the conditions? Are they uh, are they okay for investors? What are the options for connection? You said it is limited, but capacity is around, let's say, 50 megawatt up or down. Is it so hard to find such a capacity? If we acquire land, if we uh, find the connection uh, to the grid, are there any major problems or obstacles that we have to take care, take into consideration? Thank you for your answer beforehand. Um, <clears throat> so let's start step by step. Um, currently, the solar capacity installed solar, solar capacity is around three point seven gig seven gigawatts, and by the end of the year, I'm guessing it, it's gonna go over four gigawatts. Um, the measure that I mentioned from the recovery and resilience facility was developed back in twenty early twenty twenty one, I think. Uh, and it's focused on um, supporting the installation of 1.4 gigawatts of renewables plus storage facilities of around a fourth of, uh, of this installation capacity, I think, around 30, uh, 350 something uh, megawatts. Uh, the project is structured in such a way that basically the entire amount of the financial support goes into the storage facilities. So the measure supports storage rather than renewables. And this is a measure that can be used both from uh, new investors who, uh, who would like to develop, for example, a new solar farm and couple it with a storage system. And it can be used by older investors who have already uh, a renewable, for example, store, uh, solar farm which was connected to the grid, I think after 2021, but I have to double check this. Uh, and they can actually finance the acquisition of, a, of an electricity storage. So this is the, the main idea. Um, <clears throat> in general, uh, developing solar isn't very, um, isn't very difficult. As I mentioned, we've had uh, a lot of uh, cutting of red tape. So a lot of processes have, have improved. Um, land acquisition isn't very difficult. Of course, you have to uh, look for land somewhere where there's actually both um, enough solar radiation and you can have a, an easy access to some grid point where you can actually connect the uh, uh, the installation. So it's a it's very difficult for me to kind of summarize everything. But in general, there aren't a lot of um, a lot of obstacles, hindrances, or anything like this. Uh, as I mentioned, in in just two years, we've tripled the capacity from one point two gigawatts to three point seven gigawatts. So obviously, it's it's very easy for investors to both find land, um, mm -hmm. acquire it, develop the, the new installation, including uh, difficulties, as you, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, we had uh, a lot of uh, supply chain difficulties from uh, and logistical difficult, difficulties actually uh, delivering uh, parts for these systems. So even with everything that was going on in the past two years, um, in new installations have improved a lot. Unfortunately, this improvement has pretty much um, filled up most of the available capacity, the, the available grid capacity. And this is the, the main issue currently. Um, this is definitely the case for the distribution, distribution systems, for the transmission system. It's kind of difficult to uh, to judge because they have new investment projects. Some of them are aimed exactly at improving their capacity. 
Um, this year, the uh, regulator is going to approve their new business plans, which are for, for the next three years. So from, from this starting point, from the regulatory decision, we can actually try to, to, so to surmise what we can expect as uh, grid capacity development in the next couple of years. And of course, then we can have a much, much clearer uh, idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one very direct question about battery storage systems. Mm -hmm. How do we make money if we are an investor in Bulgaria just for pure storage? Is there a, such a uh, mechanism or uh, you will be using storage as a, uh, let me say, a backup, backup system for renewable energy? That means you store your extra electricity produced at top hours, then sell it in the uh, other times when there is not enough electricity generation? Or are there any plan to support system for ancillary services together with battery storage systems? If yes, how are the uh, options for the payment? Well, um... Mechanism for ancillary services are still being developed. Uh, we saw one solar farm uh, conclude the first contract for ancillary services with the uh, system operator, I think last year. So this is a, a, a niche that is about to be developed, of course, given the large amount of new uh, solar installations. So this is definitely a, a business model that should be uh, explored, unfortunately. As I said, this is still being developed, so it's difficult to give you a, a precise uh, indication. Uh, load shifting, of course, is a very easy uh, business model. As you can see already, even during the week, uh, Bulgaria has seen um, almost zero uh, prices for a couple of hours during the day in weekdays, not in mm -hmm. the weekend, but on weekdays. So this um, large installation of uh, new solar is already influencing the market. Uh, another possibility would be, of course, to uh, buy energy at zero uh, level and then sell it uh, at the peak hours, where energy could reach up to three, four hundred level in different days. But mm -hmm. in some days, of course, it doesn't reach 300, 400. So this is the, the, this is the difficulty in the in the business model. It's it's mm -hmm. very um, it's not very predictable. But judging from last year and of course new installations from this year and as I said already in March we saw uh, zero prices during the weekdays. This would mean that the um, the price curve is dramatically has dramatically changed compared to last year. So for example, last year and the year before we saw different move, movements in the price curve, but they were more or less in parallel. So for example, if during the sunny hours, the prices would fall, they would fall uh, during the peak hours as well. So, and the differential between the, the peak and the, uh, and the bottom of the price curve wasn't very, uh, very pronounced. This year, we see a completely different uh, behavior of the price curve. And this is actually something that could be explored again, in, in much more detail. But these are, I think, the main three uh, business models that could be uh, explored. Of course, uh, coupling solar with uh, wind is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. But as I said, wind, uh, new wind installations take a lot more time to develop. And um, I would guess that they need some, some sort of support. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, currently we don't see, uh, we don't see this. But this is this is just a feeling. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, wind projects in the pipeline, so investors are actually willing to take up the risk. They're seeing some uh, difficulties with again uh, grid capacity connections, uh, but in the past, I think three to four months, there has been uh, development on this uh, on this issue, and this is why I mentioned earlier. I expect to see some new projects coming to uh, to light in the next couple of years are there any licensing mechanisms for investors who will be investing only in battery storage systems for the purpose of arbitrage or uh, load shifting or generation shifting 
Again, this is uh, this is very new to uh, to the Bulgarian market. Um, last year, we saw uh, changes to the energy law, which actually introduced the legal framework for developing batteries. And until well, currently, we don't have a lot of experience with this. So this is very uncharted territory, meaning mm -hmm. it could be uh, very. I mean, there is of course the first mover advantage on this territory, but then again. There are definitely going to be some issues uh, with the actual development. And of course, the first mover would have to deal with them. And everyone afterwards would kind of benefit from the from good practices. But again, this is a, a new um, a new service for for Bulgaria. We're still expecting to see the first batteries being uh, connected to the grid and of course see what kind of business model they uh, uh, they choose. Last year there was a, an interview with one, of, one major investor in Bulgaria who said, in, this is a rough quote, that they have been looking at uh, wind plus storage and the math just doesn't add up. But this was last year. This year everyone is talking about uh, investing in storage because of the large differential in prices and of course the projection that this differential is going to uh, pretty much either stay the same or even increase. So for example, if we see zero prices now, but next month we see negative prices, mm. then we, we're talking about a completely different uh, scenario. And of course, we have to see how many months of the year and how many hours in these months we actually see close to zero or even negative prices to actually for actually the business model to make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, just to, just to to mention uh, something uh, very practical, very pragmatic. Uh, uh, Kalyan is absolutely right that all these things are are new. They are new for the investors. They are also new for the regulator. They are new for the government. But the Ministry of Energy, for example, a couple of times announces. Uh, well, it's not tenders, it's uh, kind of an open procedure for accepting uh, new project ideas which are exactly in line of promoting the renewables uh, development in uh, Bulgaria. They are linked to the National Resilience Plan. That is, there is financial support uh, behind and uh, I think that the last time they announced such kind of uh, procedure, uh, that is, it is public, it is on the website of the Ministry of Energy, was some sometime two weeks ago. So what I would recommend to, to those potential investors from your side, which uh, might be interested to, to, to have a look, at these uh, options is to have a look at the website of the Ministry of Energy uh, and just to, to, to note these procedures which are procedure for selection of new proposals concerning development of renewables within the National Resilience Plan facility. Mm -hmm. The second issue, uh, and as I said, this comes several times already the last one was something like two weeks ago there are deadlines there and all that this is this is not i want to underline uh, so to avoid misunderstanding this is not a commitment format it is only a format for so to say pre-selection that is to get ideas what the business is interested in but it is very concrete in the same time firstly when it comes to the concrete uh, financial scheme, because the National Resilience Plan is also a public document, uh, and to the type of investments uh, and the type of investors they are looking for. And it's exactly about new renewables, storage facilities, and so on. The second thing which I wanted to mention, which was touched upon, I know it's a very modern topic, still under development, not only uh, within Bulgaria, but also uh, within the world, I would say, it's about hydrogen. Uh, let me tell you that the uh, the Maritza East region, this is the coal region of Bulgaria, 
was uh, uh, announced to be one, I think there are eight regions in Europe, in the European Union, one of the new potential hydrogen valleys around Europe. And there is a special project on that. There is special financial scheme behind, and there is a, a special body uh, from Bulgaria, which is uh, indicated, so to say, to lead uh, the process. It is a um, regional, it's agency for regional economic development in the city of Stara Zagora. So if there is a concrete investor who might be interested concretely in this aspect, uh, uh, in the in the hydrogen uh, area, uh, we are ready to to provide concrete contacts and to support getting very quickly very precise information about that. So these were the two practical things which I wanted to underline. Firstly, about please have a look at the website of the ministry to see the proposals for these. That is the request for these. Uh, uh, business proposals, uh, and second about the hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure it is much easier uh, to transport hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, produced in uh, Bulgaria to send to other uh, European uh, users or consumers. So it might be a good idea to check uh, availability of investment options over there. Uh, please continue. Yeah, I just wanted to say that they are looking forward for partners in this aspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to tell you that um, the Maritza East region, which covers uh, in practical terms not only Stara Zagora, but it's also three other uh, oblast, three other huge administrative uh, units of uh, uh, Bulgaria uh, is uh, in a way very preferential when it comes to new investments uh, because uh, as I mentioned, this is the coal area, the key coal area of Bulgaria. And now with uh, the phasing out of coal, the focus is definitely on the development of renewables uh, in all uh, in all uh, aspects plus battery storage digitalization and so on and so on. so what i mean any investor who comes with concrete proposal will be more than welcome mm -hmm. this is what i want to mention okay thank you very much uh, there is one last question i want to mention in turkey uh, Industrial uh, customers mm. have a certain right to install renewable energy. Mm. In that, like solar, for example, it could be a rooftop application, or they can even install solar power plant, uh, which is not so close to their uh, factory. It is a they have a right. Plus, if you have uh, like gas fired power plant you can still have some solar uh, install capacity within the boundaries of your uh, factory let me say or utility so in turkey we have this kind of options do we have similar options in bulgaria like hybrid electricity generation or for uh, consumer uh, industrial consumers have some right to install solar or wind in their facilities? Uh, yeah, we have those. Uh, we've actually seen two distinct models for um, specifically for industry, uh, industrial companies to actually decarbonize their uh, some of their activities. One of them installs um, solar uh, panels either within the um, within their territory or some of them actually develop them um, somewhere near their somewhere near their activities uh, and of course there's a direct connection between the power plant and the industrial uh, consumer <clears throat> if this these installations are meant only for uh, the sole consumption of the industrial consumer 
uh, they uh, there is a much easier administrative procedure for their development. Another another business model that some companies use, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, one producer, one um, metallurgy producer in uh, near Plovdiv, is actually con concluding a PPA with a, uh, with a trader who's developing a new solar power plant somewhere in the north of the country. So the, consum the consumer is in the south of the country and the producer is basically at the north of, of the country. But this is a PPA agreement, so it's a little bit different from what you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you can have a, a, a you can build your own solar power plant and in, in the north of the country in the east it doesn't matter but as long as it uses the transmission or the distribution system again you're faced with the connection capacity so this is the the the, the bottleneck i was trying to uh, stress on during the presentation but if you if you have a direct line from the the, uh, the production capacity to the consum to, to the consumer, then it's a much easier uh, administrative procedure. You basically bypass the uh, grid um, bottleneck, and everything kind of um, works much easier. Um, the same, pretty much the same goes for uh, thermal power plants. We actually have uh, one example of uh, near Bobovdol where they use coal, now they're developing solar, they're trying to bring gas there, so it's a very interesting project. We're looking for uh, uh, looking for its uh, development in the next year, so there are such uh, possibilities. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any final note from any participants? If not, uh, we can close the session. I'd like to thank you, all participants, especially our Bulgarian friends, because of their participation. Uh, I think we benefited a lot. Uh, thank you for Foreign Economic Relations Board members as well. They have actually made it possible. And also from uh, friends, uh, TESAP. If there is any remarks, any closing remarks, I can, we can uh, listen. If not, we are closing the webinar. I think there is nothing. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.